Hello, welcome to Dr. Sam's Anatomy Classes. I'm Dr. Azmi Mohsen. In this presentation, I'm going to tell you about the direct and indirect light reflex. As you can see that the pupil constricts and dilate. This is a natural autonomic phenomenon. It happens on its own, right? You have no control over this. So that's why it's called a reflex. Now the purpose of this reflex is to enable the eye to adjust to the brightness or illumination outside so that the intense amount of light should not reach and harm the retina and at the same time to provide you a clear cut sharp vision also. Got it? So direct and indirect means like direct when you're talking about a single eye. When you're focusing upon a single eye, there is contraction and dilatation of the pupil. That's a direct reflex. And at the same time, if you find, you know, you're pointing a torch here, the constriction will happen equally and simultaneously in the opposite eye as well. And that is called a consensual light reflex or an indirect light reflex. All right. And you know that this happens, this, you know, phenomenon of constriction of pupils is a parasympathetic response. With, and it is mediated with the help of constricted pupillae muscles. While this dilatation is called midriasis and midriasis is a sympathetic phenomenon. Right? So midriasis is dilatation of the pupil and meiosis is constriction of the pupil. That's a parasympathetic phenomenon. So now let's uh, talk about the pathway of this direct and indirect light reflex. Okay? Here you're seeing is the pathway of pupillary constriction, right? The pupillary reflex. So here you're seeing are the two eyeballs, right? And this blue color thing, the blue color track they have shown is the afferent limb of this visual reflex. And the green color they have used is for the efferent pathway or the efferent limb of the visual reflex. So, like when there is a uh, light entering, let's we, we we should talk about here this eye. We are talking about this eye. This presumably is the left eye, right? So, the, when light enters there, uh, you know, from the retina, uh, you know, this is the first neurons, the you know, photoreceptors, first neurons. Then the impulse travels, you know, this visual impulse is transmit, uh, trans, you know, it's converted into uh, the electrochemical impulse and through the first neurons, the photoreceptors, the impulse is carried through the bipolar neurons, the second neurons in the retina and then there are the third layer of neurons and they would call the ganglion cells. So the third neurons in the retina, the ganglion cells with the central processes, they form the optic nerve. Now these third neurons, you know, they pass through the optic chiasma from the, uh, you know, if you're talking of this light, this eye, so the temporal fibers, they pass out like here from the optic chiasma uncrossed and they reach the optic tract. While at the same time, if the light is obviously coming from the opposite side as well, so the nasal fibers, the nasal hemiretina will carry those impulses along the third fiber, third neurons and will cross this optic chiasma and reach the optic tract of the opposite side. Got it? So let's presume there are 100% fibers reaching there. Now what happens in optic tract that 90% fibers, they reach to the LGB, little geniculate body, while 10% fibers through the medial limb of this optic tract, they reach to various other nuclei and that's the non-genuculate pathway and this non-genuculate pathway is for you know, like your unconscious visual impulses and while this 90% fibers they're for your conscious visual perception. So the 90% fibers you know from this LGB they pass beyond with the help of those fourth neurons to the occipital cortex right the visual striate area 
But we are not talking about that, we are talking about the 10% fibers and among those 10% fibers, few fibers reach to this pretectal nucleus. You are seeing here the pretectal nucleus, they shaded it in blue color, right? We are talking about this pretectal nucleus. So, these are the third neurons which reach the pretectal nucleus. And now, free from pretectal nucleus, there will be the fourth neurons which will emerge out from the pretectal nucleus. So, from you know, pretectal nucleus, you see that the fourth neuron they actually innovate or they reach the eringa vespal nucleus of the both the sides, like both they are paired. This nucleus is Edinga Vespal nucleus is also called Edinga Vespal PG. This is a new concept. I already told you about this. And this is also called accessory oculomotor nerve nucleus. This is also called visceral oculomotor nucleus. These are different names for the same nucleus. So from pretectal, the fibers reach to the Edinga Vespal nucleus. This is the fourth neuron. Up till here, up till like reaching up to Edinga Vespal nucleus, that's the afferent limb, right? The four neurons through which the visual impulses unconsciously reach the Edinga Vespal PG nucleus. Now, the, this green color one they have shown is Edinga Vespal. Now, this Edinga Vespal actually, you know, it's a general visceral efferent nucleus and in this functional column it is the highest placed nucleus at the level of superior colliculus adjacent to the oculomotor of nucleus got it okay so the from here they are like you know it's a pre parasympathetic outflow that happens so there you know two sets of neurons preganglionic will arise from here while the paras you know postganglionic fibers will arise here another way you can call it the central fibers the peripheral fibers preganglionic postganglionic right so the preganglionic fibers will emerge out along with this oculomotor nerve fibers. They'll cross the red nucleus in the intraneural pathway, then the crest cerebri, then oculomotor sulcus, then to the edinga vespa, to this you know interpedangular fossa, then this you know cavernous sinus, and then through this lower division of oculomotor nerve, it will cross the superior orbital fissure, and then. Uh, you know, why this nerve to inferior oblique, they will relay here in the ciliary ganglion. And from the ciliary ganglion, now the peripheral uh, parasympathetic or you can say the postganglionic parasympathetic fibers will emerge out and why does remember sh short ciliary nerves, short ciliary nerves, not the long ciliary nerve. I told the concept why this not long ciliary nerves were for sympathetic outflow. Okay, so the short ciliary nerves. <coughs> Why them they will reach you know the pierce sclera choroid and they will ultimately supply the you know constrictor pupillae muscle in the iris and they will bring about this response of constriction whenever there is a light either in both of the eyes. Now similarly what happens if we can presume the image the visual impulse is reaching the right eye that will that will also cross you know this side and from their side it will reach to the the effectors you know effectors will reach both the sides in the you know Edinga Vespal of the both sides. So, there will be constriction in both the sides, both the eyes. And one another thing you can see that both the pretectal nucleus are intercommunicating with the help of interneurons and that is a commissural band. So, that means if you point a torch in either of the eyes, either in this eye or either in this eye, if you flash a light, there will be constriction of pupils in both the eyes. So, if you are seeing constriction in the same eye, that is called direct light reflex and if you are focusing light here, but you are seeing the response here opposing in opposite eye, the constriction happening opposite eye, that is called the indirect light response or the consensual light reflex. But the condition is that when you are pointing torch in one eye, there should be no direct light reaching to the opposite side. That is why, you know, you place a, you know, you place a bridge or a shade so that the light should not reach the opposite side. Got it? This should be a barrier in between. Okay, so that was about the direct and indirect light reflex. <coughs> I have told you the pathway. The blue one is the afferent limb and the green one is the efferent. Then in case if it's asked like how many neurons do participate in this reflex arch, I told you the three neurons in the retina, the fourth one from pretectal to edinga vespal, that was the fourth. 
Now, fifth and sixth even include is the periganglionic and postganglionic parasympathetic fibers. So, in total, you have six neurons in this reflex arch. Got it? So, it utilizes six neurons. Now, uh, uh, the important thing about remains is like, you know, everybody, I mean, you know, most of you must be aware of all this. The purpose of telling important is like the MCQs framed on this. What will be the MCQs framed on this? So, there like, you know, that will be about the lesions. So, MCQs are generally framed upon the lesions in this pathway. So, lesions we will talk one by one. First of all, like, you know, there are three set of uh, questions that can be asked. One is like uh, we're talking about the afferent limb, right? Lesions in the afferent limb will be one set of questions. Lesions in the efferent limb that be that will be the another set of questions. And lesions in the geniculate pathway, right? From the LGB to the optic radiation, that will be another set of questions. So let's imagine if we're talking about, let's say we are, you know. We are talking about this light entering from the left eye. If the light is entering from the left eye, right? We are pointing a torch here in the left eye and there is a lesion here in the optic nerve. So, what will happen? Will there be constriction of people? Let's, you know, I need not write it although, but still I am writing it is the left eye and this is the right eye. So, if it's asked like if they are pointing a torch in the left eye and there is any optic you know, nerve injury on the same left side. So, will be there any pupillary constriction in the left eye? Any guesses? Obviously, if you are pointing a torch here, <coughs> the afferent limb is blocked. So, what happened because the no impulse is reaching to a ring of espal nucleus, right? So, there will be no effector response happening. So, there will be no constriction of people in the same eye, neither in the opposite eye. That was condition number one that I have described. Okay, that is done. Now, if think of there is the same thing, you know, this is injured in the left eye optic nerve. And this time you are focusing light, you are focusing light in the right eye. You are pointing a torch in the right eye and there is an injury of optic nerve of the left eye. What will happen? Will there be constriction of people in the right eye? Because the impulse will reach to the edenga vespal nucleus, right? And right integral of spinal nucleus. So, there will be efferent response. So, there will be constriction of people in the right eye. But because there is a bilateral, you know, uh, representation from the fibers from right edinger of spinal, I mean, pretectal nucleus will supply both these edinger of spinal PG on both the sides. So, there will be constriction on the opposite or the injured eye as well. Got it now? So, this is number 2 condition that I have already told you. So, if the, the if you are pointing torch in the normal eye, there will be constriction of people in both the eye, including the injured eye. Got it? So, that was about the afferent limb. Now, let us talk about the efferent limb. Efferent limb may there will be two conditions. Either the injury is here at edinga vespal nucleus. Let us say this is injured. This is injured, right? So, what will happen like pointing a torch in the right eye will, I mean this is right side edinga vespal nucleus that is damaged we are talking. So, if they are focusing right uh, image on the, uh, you know, torch on the right eye, will there be constriction of people in the right eye? No, because the efferent pathway to the same eye is injured. So, there will be no constriction in the right eye. But if you are pointing torch the lesion is still here and you pointing towards the right side, will there be constriction in the left eye? Yes. Reason is from pretectal, their fibers are reaching to the opposite edinger. So, will be constriction in this eye, but not in this eye. If there is unilateral damage of edinger vespal nucleus, got it? So, that was condition number 3 that has been discussed. Now, think about the next condition here is, you know, if there is, uh, uh, you know, 
I'm sorry I couldn't rub these email, you know, there's no eraser with me. So consider this, this to be happening bilateral. If there is a lesion bilateral, this much big lesion, there is a lesion of bilateral Edinga Westphal nucleus and you're pointing a torch here, right? So if you're pointing a torch here on the right side and the lesion is here, got it? bilaterally on the ring of espal. So, will there be constriction in the right eye? No, already damaged. Will there be constriction in the opposite eye? No, because that's, you know, the fibers reaching to the opposite anger of Engpal, that also is injured. So, no efferent limb possible, no efferent impulses, uh, conduction of impulses is possible. So, no constriction in both the eyes. So, that was condition number four that also is done. Okay. Presume this to be normal now. I mean, you know, because I'm not having eraser, I cannot, I don't want to rub everything. So, if these two are normal, Edinga Westphal nucleus is normal. Now, only lesion you're finding is here in the ciliary ganglion. Let's say these ciliary ganglion or the postganglionic fibers, these are injured and the rest of the pathway is absolutely normal. And you're pointing torch on the right eye. Will there be constriction of people on the right side? No, because up till all this pathway is fine, but impulses will not proceed further beyond because of the injury to the ciliary ganglion or the postganglion neurons on the right side. So, no constriction of people here. But if you are pointing a torch here, there will be constriction of left eye. The reason is the pathway, this also is intact and this also is intact. So, it will be constriction here. Got it? So, that means you have got to know, I mean, I think I have taught you enough of the conditions possible. This also has been done, right? So, this was, uh, you know, condition number 5. This has been done. Okay. Next, we are going to talk about is, uh, yeah. So, this lesion remains and we are talking now about the injury here. Let us presume that if there is injury to the lateral limb of the optic tract or Edinga Vespal, uh, sorry, uh, LGB, lateral genuclear body or optic radiation or this, you know, optic uh, striate area, you know, calcarine sulcus, visual striate area, area number 17. So, beyond LGB, beyond LGB, if there will be lesion at anywhere in this portion of the geniculate pathway and you are pointing a torch here in the left eye, will there be any constriction, I mean, will there be a pupillary response here? Yes, of course, because the pathway, afferent pathway is completely separate and it is different from the medial limb of the optic tract, right? So, there will be a proper constriction in the left eye as well as in the right eye. So, if there is a lesion here round and you are pointing a torch on the right side, right, will there be constriction on both the sides? The reason is like it will happen in both the sides because the impulses are reaching here also, here also without any, you know, link to this, uh, you know, geniculate pathway. So, that means and you know, the efferents are also intact. So, will be, <coughs> there will be constriction of the people of both the sides. That, that, that means what? The geniculate pathway has nothing to do with this pupillary reflex. Got it? Okay, so this was number six. And lastly, one more option we will talk about is uh, this one. Let us say if there is a lesion here, what will happen? in the optic tract, we are talking of yellow color. So, what will happen if there is a lesion on the left optic tract and we are pointing a torch in the left eye, will there be pupillary constriction in this eye? Yes, there will be pupillary constriction. Why? Because it has two parts of the retina, right and left hemiretina, remember? So, temporal fibers the illumination from the impulses from the temporal fibers will not reach to the pretectal, right? But the impulses from the nasal half of the retina will reach the pretectal nucleus to the opposite side, and then from there it will, you know, it will uh, set impulses to both the ringa vespal nucleus. So there will be constriction of both the eyes. Got it? 
So that is important. I believe you have understood all this. And so this was all about the optic, uh, you know, pupillary reflexes. Now we will talk about the direct pupillary light reflex. And I have prepared this small demonstration for you so you can see how you can demonstrate uh, pupillary light reflex. I am going to demonstrate you the direct light reflex, the pupillary reflex in one eye. So as you flash the beam of light, you will see that there is a pupillary constriction in the same eye. This is the direct light reflex. Right? Okay. Okay, now I am going to show you the indirect or the consensual light reflex. So I have demonstrated this on my students and you can see how to perform this indirect or the consensual light reflex. Okay, now I am going to demonstrate the indirect light reflex that is called consensual light reflex. So in this, can you see both the pupils are normally relaxed and now we are going to make a bridge here in between the two eyes. The purpose is so that when, when we are focusing light here on the right eye, the light should not reach directly on the left eye. So we are going to focus here the light on the right side and at the same time I am going to show the constriction in the opposite eye that is the left eye. Can you see the constriction? Do it once again. Once again. Okay. So that was all in this presentation. I hope you understood. Thank you.